9 Most Terrifying Mysteries Phenomena, That Still Remain Unsolved Author M. B. Ford compiled a list of some of the world's most terrifying unexplained phenomena, weird places, and strange photos. Below are a few of his creepiest stories handpicked by us that are perfect for Halloween night. 1. The Enfield Poltergeist. In 1977, a little home in England became a chilling house of horrors. Those who have seen the 2016 hit film The Conjuring 2 know that it opens with the Amityville case, possibly the most famous paranormal case in history, thanks to the various books and movies that it spawned. That said, the majority of the film is actually occupied with the case of the so-called Enfield Poltergeist. While the Enfield Poltergeist may not be as familiar as the Amityville case, or even the Perrin case, which was the focus of the first Conjuring film, news of the haunting caused a media frenzy, with stories appearing in newspapers and on television. So what really happened in that small rented house at 284 Green Street in Enfield, England between 1977 and 1979? In August of 1977, Peggy Hodgson called the police to come to her house after her four children had reported furniture moving on its own, and knocking coming from inside the walls. Caroline Heaps was one of the officers who arrived at the home, and later signed an affidavit that she had seen a chair levitate and move almost four feet without being touched. Of course, poltergeist activity is somewhat outside the purview of the police, so there was little they could do. However, the story drew the attention of paranormal investigators, such as members of the Society for Psychical Research, professors of psychology, and, of course, Ed and Lorraine Warren. In real life, the Warrens were much less involved than their cinematic counterparts, arriving uninvited, according to one source, and staying for less than a day. A few of the investigators most heavily involved in the Enfield case included Guy Lyon Playfair, John Belov, Morris Gross, and Anita Gregory. Both Gross and Gregory even found their way into the film version. While Gross and Playfair maintained the veracity of the haunting, they also found reason to doubt some of the claims. Along with the skeptical Gregory and Belov, other authorities chimed in to debunk many of the events. This led many people to dismiss the entire case as a hoax. Gregory later described the Enfield case as overrated, stating that several incidents had been staged. Whether real or faked, the events were apparently chilling to witness. Aside from banging on the walls, bending silverware, and furniture moving on its own, 11-year-old Janet Hodgson was said to have levitated above her bed, and to have spoken in a voice purportedly belonging to a man named Bill Wilkins, who had died in the house before the Hodgsons moved in. Just before I died, I went blind, the male-sounding voice emanating from Janet's mouth said, and then I had an hemorrhage and I fell asleep and I died in the chair in the corner downstairs. The voice was recorded by Morris Gross, and can still be heard today. The son of Bill Wilkins later confirmed that the events described were accurate. While some claimed that Janet was simply practicing ventriloquism, and magician Bob Kutsky later reviewed the tapes and found nothing in what I had heard that was beyond the capabilities of an imaginative teenager, it's difficult to listen to that recording and not feel a chill up your spine. Even after the poltergeist activity tapered off, following a priest's visit in 1978, Peggy Hodgson still claimed to hear noises in the house. Her youngest son Billy said that he always felt like there was someone in the room with him. After Peggy Hodgson's death in 2003, Claire Bennett moved into the house at 284 Green Street with her three sons. Like Billy, she reported that she always felt like someone was watching her, and her sons reported hearing voices from downstairs in the middle of the night. When her 15-year-old son Shaka woke up and saw a man coming into his room, the family moved out after staying for only two months. While we'll probably never know what really happened, the story remains one of the most documented and studied paranormal cases in history, and with the success of The Conjuring 2, interest in the Enfield poltergeist has only increased. 2. Toys R Us in Sunnyvale since the Sunnyvale Toys R Us store opened in the early 1970s, staff and customers have experienced a wide range of strange goings-on. 
The photograph you see here was taken during a seance held at the store, for a television show that was looking into the haunting. Taken with an infrared sensitive camera, the photo shows the seated group, together with a figure standing at the back, watching. No one present remember seeing anyone standing during the seance, and other cameras shooting the same view all failed to capture this figure. The Haunting Staff and customers alike at the Sunnyvale, California, Toys R Us store have experienced what they believe is a haunting. It is not just one or two staff members, but many. Some of the more common, strange events that occur involve staff hearing their names whispered to them cold breezes and objects moving of their own accord. Taps would turn on by themselves in the women's bathroom, and many of the store's female employees had experienced something unseen playing with their hair. It is never anything violent and it does not seem to target anyone in particular, besides mainly women. Staff who have come to terms with the idea that their store is haunted regard it as a friendly, if a little mischievous, presence. But when the phenomena was first beginning to be experienced back in the 70s, it did take the staff unawares. As you would expect, the staff were a little freaked out by the strange poltergeist-like happenings, so some outside help was sought. As word got around, local newspapers started covering the story and in 1978 they brought in, then, renowned and respected psychic, medium Sylvia Brown to make contact and try to work out what was going on and who the spirit may be. Sylvia Brown was able to make contact, and the identity of the spirit was found to be Johnny Johnson, a Scandinavian immigrant, who used to work the farm, plantation that used to be located on the land where the store now stands. Luckily plenty of research has been done on the plantation itself, and some facts can be confirmed about this story. The History in 1844 a man named Martin Murphy traveled to California via covered wagon, pulled by oxen, his party was the first to cross the Sierras in such a fashion, and settled in what is now Sunnyvale. Murphy set up a ranch, plantation, and when he needed a few employees to work the land and its resources, he hired Johan Johnson, Johnny Johnson. Johnny fell in love with Murphy's daughter Elizabeth, but she rejected him. Johnny's bad luck was not complete until he was infected with encephalitis, and was left slightly brain damaged as a result. Luckily he was still capable of working on the ranch. However, he was given the nickname Crazy Johnny thereafter. It was in 1884, while he was chopping wood, that Johnny accidentally smashed himself with the axe and bled to death alone, near the orchard. The Murphy Ranch continued to be occupied by several generations of the family until 1950, when it was given to the city of Sunnyvale. In 1961 the building was gutted by a fire and was soon demolished. In 1970, a 60,000 square foot Toys R Us store was built on the location, and then the hauntings began. The Seance It was during a seance held by Sylvia Brown, and attended by a large number of the store's employees that she was able to give much of this information, but mainly that concerning Johnny, or Joey as Sylvia put it, and his demise and love for Beth, Elizabeth. Also attending the seance were several photographers, experts. The store was darkened, as the gathering settled down in one of the more active aisles of the store. A few lights were left on at the end of the aisle to provide some light for one of the cameras using high-speed film. Another camera was using infrared film. Both were pointing in the same direction. As the seance progressed, the others gathered stated that they could hear and or feel a high-pitched buzzing in their heads, as Sylvia talked with Johnny. Sylvia made contact almost immediately and told the group that Johnny was presently manifested to some degree, however no one could see him. The photo. Fortunately Johnny could not hide from the cameras, and thus we have this photograph. This is the image as captured by the camera running with infrared film. You can clearly see a slightly transparent human form leaning against one of the shelves, watching the group in front. The bright flaring of light gives the pants he, I'll call it a he from here on in, is wearing a strange shape. He also appears to be holding an object in his hands, possibly a hat or cap of some form. No one in the group saw anyone standing during the seance that night and only the one camera captured the image, 
although other cameras were running at the same time, pointing at the same spot. When Silver told Johnny that he could go, and that he does not need to wait any longer, he replied stating that he would continue waiting for Beth, and in the meantime he enjoys the company in the store and playing with the children. The haunting has continued. What do you think? Could this really be the image of John D. Johnson? Or just someone accidentally in frame that no one noticed at the time? 3. Spontaneous Human Combustion For some time, people have debated whether or not human beings could spontaneously combust, or burst into flames, without an external heat source. However, over the past 300 years, there have been more than 200 reports of such incidents occurring. This phenomenon is called spontaneous human combustion, or SHC, and it occurs when a person supposedly burns to death by a fire believed to have started from within the body of that person. Of the hundreds of accounts on record, there seems to be a similar pattern. A solitary victim is often consumed by flame, usually inside his or her home. However, the extremities, such as the hands, feet, or parts of the leg often remaining intact. The torso and head are charred beyond recognition and, in rare cases, the internal organs of a victim remain unscathed. The room the victim was in usually shows little to no signs of fire, aside from a greasy residue left on furniture and walls. Often there is a sweet, smoky smell in the room where the incident has occurred. Historical examples of death claimed to be caused by spontaneous human combustion. The history of SHC can be traced back to medieval literature and some even believe there are several passages in the Bible making reference to it. In 1641, the Danish physician, Thomas Bartholin, 1616-1680, described the death of Polonus of Orsius in his book Historiarum and Atomicarum Rariorum, a collection of strange medical phenomena. Vorsius was an Italian knight who, while at his home in Milan, Italy in 1470, drank some strong wine and started vomiting flames before bursting into fire. This is considered to be the first recorded account of spontaneous combustion in human history. In 1673, French author Jonas Dupont, published a book entitled De Incendius Corporis Humani Spontanis which is a collection of cases and studies on the subject of SHC. One famous incident from France dates back to 1725, when a Parisian innkeeper was awoken by the smell of smoke and discovered that his wife, Nicole Millet, had been reduced to ashes while lying on a straw pallet which itself had been untouched by the flames. All that remained of Madame Millet, a chronic alcoholic, was her skull, a few bones from her back and lower legs. Wooden items found around her were undamaged. Her husband was charged with murder and initially found guilty. On appeal, however, the judges agreed with his defense of spontaneous human combustion, thanks in part to the testimony of a surgeon named Dr. Claude Nicolas Lecat. Lecat was at the inn when the smell of smoke awoke the house and Nicole's body was discovered. Her death was later declared to be the consequence of a visitation of God. Spontaneous human combustion became popularized in the 19th century after famous English author, Charles Dickens, used it to kill off one of his characters in the novel Bleak House. When critics accused Dickens of trying to validate something that didn't exist, he simply pointed to existing research showing 30 historical cases at the time. Common characteristics of victims of spontaneous human combustion is put forth in 1938. The topic of SHC received coverage in the British Medical Journal in 1938 when an article by L. A. Perry cited a book published in 1823 called Medical Jurisprudence. It stated that cases of spontaneous human combustion shared several common themes including, the victims were chronic alcoholics, they were usually elderly females, the body had burned spontaneously, but some lighted substance had also come into contact with it. The hands and feet usually fell off, the fire had caused very little damage to many other combustible things in contact with the body, the combustion of the body has left a residue of greasy and feta dashes, very offensive in odor. Alcoholism seems to have played a heavy role in early references to SHC, partially because some Victorian era physicians and writers believed spontaneous human combustion was caused by it. The Wick Effect 
a scientific explanation for SHC. There are several theories as to what causes SHC apart from the above-mentioned alcoholism. These include, flammable body fat, acetone buildup, static electricity, methane, bacteria, stress, and even divine intervention. 4. The Cooper Falling Body Ever since the camera was invented, hundreds or thousands of images have shown something odd within the framing of the shot. A lot of these occurred without the knowledge of either the photographer or subjects of the snapshot itself. Many of the more famous ghost photographs came about by the photographer being in the right place at the right time, mostly without even realizing it. One of the more recent examples of this came to light in or around 2009. From the moment this photograph entered the public domain, debate has raged on its authenticity. This photograph was said to have taken some time during the 1950s on the day that the whole family moved into a new home. Mr. Cooper had Mrs. Cooper, Grandma Cooper and both children pose for a standard family portrait. What nobody realized during the exposure was that there was a fifth subject captured in the photograph. When the picture was developed, the trespasser was found on the left-hand side of the photograph, either falling from, or hanging from, the ceiling. Mr. Cooper was said to have been adamant that nobody else was in the frame when he took the photograph that night. None of the subjects were aware of their spooky-looking visitor either, as all were posing happily as one might expect. That was the basis behind this now famous photo. Assuming that this Cooper family photo was not, as some insist, a modern Photoshop design, then who else appeared in shot? Could this be an apparition of a former owner or tenant of the house? Nobody could answer that question. Perhaps an alternative explanation is that this image came about as an example of a double exposure. When the photograph was examined more closely, a process called vignetting was discovered in the corners of the picture. While this effect can be the result of lens limitations or certain camera settings, these examples appear too uniform in nature for it to be some random event without manipulation from appropriate software such as Photoshop or PaintShop. Critics also point to the shadows of the subject, insisting that they fall in a direction not according to the given light sources available. These arguments indicate either deception on the part of someone or an honest mistake when faced with an unfortunate double exposure. A hoax or deliberate fabrication would have to be done by someone. The photograph was reportedly uploaded onto the World Wide Web on November 14, 2009 by Sam Gowan. Once this photograph appeared on Ligotti.net, a fan site for author Thomas Ligotti, titled Family Gathering, an investigation concluded that Sam was not responsible for its creation. Within months the photo was doing the internet rounds on many other paranormal sites. Xavier Ortega posted it on the website Ghost Theory but denied being responsible for its design. The outcome of this uploading did bring this photo to a much wider audience than it had had before. The backstory of the Texan Cooper family seemed to have been announced sometime after this, first appearing in 2013. Photographers have also speculated why this image was so poorly framed. The obvious subjects were the immediately family but the image isn't centered on them. It has been suggested that the original image was cropped sometime after development and that the family originally took center stage in the portrait. This could be true, if the picture is genuine. But ever since the photo was revealed, there has been little to no talk about the negatives. That might arouse some suspicion and lend weight to the hoax idea. Whether this is a real image, Photoshop work of art or a simple camera aberration, it is an intriguing image that will surely be around for quite a few years, appearing in YouTube Top 10 Strange Photographs Countdowns on a regular basis. 5. The Moving Coffins of the Chase Family Vault Barbados may be known as a popular tourist destination, but local culture and history involve more than just white sand beaches and fruity mixed drinks. In the center of the island is Christ Parish Church, whose graveyard, like many graveyards, has a few ghost stories. One particular tale involves a family's tragic saga, and a legacy of post-mortem unrest. In 1808, the Chase family purchased the vault for the burial of their child, an infant by the name of Marianne Maria, some claim her name was Anne Marie, or Mary Anne Marie. 
The tomb had been built in 1724, and already held the body of a Miss Thomasina Goddard, buried in 1807. Colonel Thomas Chase, patriarch of the family, decided against disturbing the deceased by moving her coffin out of his new family vault. Four years after they buried their baby, the Chases had to bury another child, their daughter Dorcas. The circumstances surrounding her death were more than slightly unusual. The young girl starved herself to death, apparently as an act of rebellion against her father, Thomas, who was supposedly abusing her. The girl's body was buried beside her infant sisters, each small body held in lead caskets. Just one month after burying Dorcas, Thomas Chase himself died, strangely, his death was also a suicide. The family prepared Thomas' body and opened the Chase vault, but what they claimed to find inside was shocking. Where there had previously been three coffins lined neatly in a row, the tomb was now a scattered mess, with each casket appended and in a different place. The coffins themselves seemed to have been moved. The Chase family was shocked, but they chalked up the seam to grave robbers. The coffins were once again arranged neatly, and Thomas' casket, made of lead just as his daughter's had been, and weighing nearly 240 pounds, was added. The massive marble stone was rolled back into place, taking several men to do so, and the entrance was sealed. The next death in the family was Charles Brewster Ames, in 1816. Again, the 11-year-old's body was prepared for burial and the chase vault was opened. The invasion of 1812 seemed to have happened again. All four coffins, including Thomas' tremendously heavy one, were displaced, as if they had been tossed like toys. And yet, the entrance had not be tampered with. Once again, the coffins were returned to their original place, and the tomb was resealed. It was around this time that the public began to take interest in the stories that were being told of the moving coffins. Twice more, in 1816 and in 1819, the tomb was reopened to add the coffin of a family member and, both times, the vault was said to have been rearranged from within. It seemed that the dead really were not at rest. Secondary stories, of hearing shrieks from within the tomb, or of horses being spooked while passing it, also became more and more prevalent. The governor of Barbados himself even took interest in the case. He ordered an inspection of the chase vault, inside and out, and, after being satisfied that it was secure, had a fine dust sprinkled on the floor and his own signet ring stamped into the seal on the door. Eight months later he returned. Externally, everything was in order and the seal was intact. Curiosity called for the door to be opened, at which point onlookers saw to their horror that the coffins, once again, had been thrown about the inside chamber. This time, the movement seemed to be quite violent, with Mary Ann's coffin thrown so forcefully into a wall that the corner of her casket had broken off. This was the last time that the vault was reopened. Each coffin was individually buried, hoping to restore some peace to the individuals whose bodies were inside. The tomb itself remains empty, and open, with nothing but stories passing through. Although the story has circulated for over 200 years, researchers call it historically dubious. No burial records or newspaper articles exist to confirm the tale as it allegedly happened and certain details of the event echo of Freemason allegory of secret vaults and restless coffins. However, there was a Chase family living in Barbados at the time, and others who swear by the facts of the tale. Whether or not it can be known for certain, it seems telling that the tomb has remained open, that the Chase family bodies have remained separated, specifically, those of Dorcas and her father Thomas, and no mysterious movement has since happened. 6. Amityville Ghost Caught on Film The Amityville horror haunting is still a very popular subject both inside and outside the circle of paranormal researchers and enthusiasts. It is the story of the Lutz family, who went through a nightmarish 28 days inside the house at 108 Ocean Avenue in 1975 has become known worldwide. The house had previously been the residence of the DeFeo family about a year or so before the Lutzes moved in. That is until 23-year-old Ronald DeFeo murdered both his parents in their beds as well as his four siblings, Don, 18 years old, Mark, 12, and John Matthew, 9. 
Since the Lutzes fled the horror house, the story of what occurred to the family in less than a month's time in Long Island has been turned into a book, made into a movie and spawned the name of a famous fictional horror movie franchise. It is also one creepy photo. The picture, which appears to be of a small boy with glasses or a man kneeling on the floor with glowing eyes, has been called everything from one of the dead DeFeo children to a demon first turned up in the collection of photos George Litt said from an investigation into the haunting in 1976, led by infamous demonologist said and Lorraine Warren. During that investigation, a camera was set up on the second floor which took tons of infrared pictures during the night. According to George Litt's himself, although no one noticed it at first, one particular pic taken did indeed contain something odd. The first time that picture was shown was on the Merv Griffin show back in 1979. It was discovered three years after it was taken. Gene Campbell, who was a professional photographer, was brought into the house in 1976 when the Warrens went in with their team. He set up an automatic camera on the second floor landing that shot off infrared film, black and white, throughout the night. There are literally rolls of film with nothing on them. There's only one picture of the little boy. In 1979, I was putting together a book that has yet to be published that included the photographs. The secretary I had at the time was about eight months pregnant. We had dozens of these pictures to choose from that didn't have the boy, and she asked me, which one should we put in the book? I told her to just pick one. She came running back into my office about five minutes later saying that every time she picked up the photograph with the boy, the baby kicked her. We then asked my kids if they knew who this was. Missy said it was the little boy she used to play with in the house. I then called the Warrens and the photographer and let them know about the picture. Despite the tale of the unsettling discovery of the photo and the photo itself, some people on the Amityville Truth Board believe it could simply be the picture of one of the investigators working with the Warrens that night, Paul Bartz. The theory states that Paul Bart spares a resemblance to the ghost boy and is wearing a similar shirt. Meanwhile, the ghostly glow that radiates from the eyes would be due to the infrared film. As a theory goes it is not bad, the ghost boy and Bart's do seem to have a similar pattern on the shirts they are wearing. However the patterns are not a complete match, so there is still much room for speculation. For example, Ghostuddy.com posted the pic a few years ago with the idea that the figure in the picture resembled the youngest DeFeo child murdered in the house in 1974, namely nine-year-old John Matthew. Looking at one of the images Ghostuddy posted with the observation, it does indeed look similar. Personally I think this explanation would be too neat and cliché, it seems like something straight out of every classical ghost story ever told, where the murdered stalk the places they once died although they do say truth is often stranger than fiction. Meanwhile back at the Amity Truth Board, a member by the name of Msmard112 claims to have emailed Paul Bartz about being the possible person in the ghost boy pic, to which he claims to have received this text in part of a reply from Bartz, I am the same Paul Bartz that took part in the seance in the Amityville home some 32 years ago. The image in the photo you mentioned does resemble me and I know that Ed, now deceased, and Lorraine went on record, including national TV, stating it was a ghost. Because I have great respect and admiration for them, I will say no more on the issue, allowing the legend of the most haunted house in America, to continue. If this response is genuine and from the real Paul Bartz then it would appear that Bartz would rather keep mum on the matter, although his choice of words hints at the fact that it is indeed him in the photo. Others believe the figure is a demon, able to change its shape at will and in the form of a little boy or the shape of John Matthew DeFeo. This too is a bit far-fetched as are some of the people who have thrown this theory into the ring. What remains is a photograph that, like the entire story of both the DeFeo murders and the Amityville haunting, is shrouded in both mystery and doubt. It also has become one of the best modern ghost pics of the last 50 years. 7. The Baltic Sea Object The incredible mystery of the alien spacecraft that lies at the bottom of the Baltic Sea when the mystery object at the bottom of the Baltic Sea was first spotted in 2011, it baffled experts and excited alien hunters. 
they still don't know what it is. Dubbed the Baltic Sea Anomaly, the structure looks like the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. It was discovered five years ago by Swedish treasure hunters, Ocean X team, led by Peter Lindbergh, its captain, and his co-researcher Dennis Asberg. The Sun reports. They used a side-scan sonar and found something strange 91 meters below the surface of the water. Mystery object found in Baltic Sea. It was reported that the divers exploring the anomaly said their equipment stopped working as they approached it. Anything electric out there and the satellite phone as well, stopped working when we were above the object," professional diver Stefan Hojerborn, part of the Ocean X team, said. And then when we got away about 200 meters, it turned on again, and when we got back over the object it didn't work. The 61 meter wide and 8 meter tall circular object hit the headlines, with many speculating the anomaly could be a giant mushroom, a sunken Russian ship or an alien spaceship. A sample recovered by divers was given to geologist Steve Weiner who ruled out the possibility of it being a natural geological formation. After examining fragments, he claimed that the materials were metals which nature could not reproduce itself. Some experts think it's a Nazi anti-submarine device or a battleship gun turret. Other observers believe it is a UFO called the Roswell of the Ocean. But there is still no evidence to suggest that the UFO-like object is an alien ship. Volker Brutchert, an associate professor of geology at Stockholm University, told Life's Little Mysteries.com, My hypothesis is that this object, this structure was formed during the Ice Age many thousands of years ago. But Lindbergh and Asberg claim the samples they gave for analysis weren't from the object itself, but from the vicinity of the object, according to OpenMinds.tv. It seems that nobody wants to fund research into the Baltic Sea discovery. The question remains, what really lies beneath? 8. The Ice Woman of Minnesota The story of Jean Hilliard, a woman who made a full recovery after she was found frozen stiff in the snow in Minnesota, has been shared in various forms since it was first published in 1980. And with each reiteration the story has grown more astonishing. One of the first reports of the incident, which was published by the Montreal Gazette on December 30, 1980, explained how Hilliard had collapsed on a 22 below zero night as she tried to seek shelter after a minor car accident. The young woman was found frozen solid approximately six hours later and brought to a hospital, she breathed shallowly two or three times a minute and her heart beat faintly eight times a minute. Dr. George Sather said that I thought she was dead, but then we picked up an extremely faint whimper. We knew there was a person existing then. Jean's chances of surviving were rated slim, her body temperature didn't even register on the thermometer, and that meant it was less than 80 degrees Fahrenheit. There was no evidence of a pulse or blood pressure, said Sather's brother, Dr. Edgar Sather. Her body was too frozen to find a vein to get a pulse. Most of the stories published about Jean Hilliard immediately after the incident credited electric heating pads and oxygen tanks for her recovery, but with each retelling the story became more miraculous. When Weekly World News, the same publication has brought audiences fantastically fictional stories about their half-bet, half-human bad boy and Hitler's UFO escape, published their version of the story in January 1981. Quotes from Hilliard's parents were added that credited her recovery to the power of prayer. Guidepost magazine took this theme a step further, claiming that a prayer chain had saved Jean Hilliard's life. Mrs. Erickson hurried to her office and made a phone call to the prayer chain chairman at the Baptist church where her husband is pastor. The prayer chain was set in motion. The prayer chain was lengthening. Mrs. Erickson called the pastors of the Lutheran, Catholic, Methodist and Bethel Assembly Churches in Foston. They, in turn, called the chairman of their prayer chain groups, who passed the word along. During the first hours that the prayer chain was underway, my legs and feet, instead of getting darker as Dr. Sather expected, started to lighten and regain their natural color. One after another, the doctors and nurses filed into marvel at the pinkish tinge appearing at the line of demarcation where the darkness started on my upper thighs, the place where Dr. Sather said he thought they might have to amputate. The prayer chain spread to the nearby towns of Crookston and Bemidji, 
and into Grand Forks, North Dakota. Soon hundreds, then thousands of people were aware that a young woman had been brought into the Foston Hospital frozen solid and was in desperate need of God's miraculous healing. While some may consider Hilliard's recovery a miracle, the New York Times even quoted Dr. Sathers deeming the young woman's survival as such, her experience was not a rare one. In an article published by the Spartanburg Herald in January 1981, Dr. Richard Isaac said that it was not unusual for freezing victims to make full recoveries. The recovery of a Minnesota woman frozen stiff after an idling ordeal in sub-zero weather was described as a miracle by her doctor. But other physicians say such miracles are not all that rare, freezing victims have recovered fully even after prolonged periods without heartbeats. There's a term we have that says no one is dead until he's warm and dead, said Dr. Richard Isk, Associated Director of the Boston Emergency Medical Center, which every winter treats victims of freezing or, more accurately, hypothermia. Although Hilliard is undeniably lucky to survive, Isk said there are numerous case reports in the medical literature of people who have survived, with interior body temperatures, as low as 68 or 69 degrees. The human body reacts to extreme cold much like a hibernating animal, internal activity is slowed, which dramatically reduces the cell's demand for oxygen from the blood. Jean Hilliard's recovery was incredible, some may even say miraculous, but it is not an unsolved medical mystery. 9. The Mystery of Elisa Lamb On February 1, 2013, Elise Lamb vanished while staying at the Cecil Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. The 21-year-old Canadian college student was in the middle of a solo West Coast tour at the time of the disappearance. In an attempt to locate her, the Los Angeles Police Department released the last known images they had of Lamb, a snippet of security footage taken in the hotel's elevator on the day of her vanishing. But the clip was far from ordinary. In the video, Lamb enters the elevator and presses nearly all the buttons, causing the car to stall. As the doors remain open, Lamb peeks out into the hallway, exiting and re-entering several times. She rocks in place and gestures with her arms, as if communicating with someone off-camera. Her movement is unsteady. Finally, Lamb disappears down the hall to her left, the elevator doors closing behind her. The chilling clip made its way online where it quickly went viral. Some theorize that Lamb was on drugs, that she was mentally ill, or both. Others claimed she was possessed, or hiding from someone, or something, that can't be seen on the video. The Cecil Hotel is known for its dark history. Elizabeth Short, aka the Black Dahlia, supposedly stayed at the Cecil before she was murdered in 1947. Goldie Osgood, known as the Pigeon Lady of Pershing Square was raped and murdered in her hotel room in 1964. Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, and his cop P. Cab Jack under Ouija lived at the Cecil while they committed their crimes. The hotel has also played host to many a suicide, including one woman who killed a passing pedestrian after jumping from above. Two weeks passed, and Elisa Lamb remained missing. At the same time, Guests at the Cecil began complaining of low water pressure in their rooms and brownish water seeping out of the tap. On the morning of February 19, a hotel employee named Santiago Lopez went to check on the hotel's four rooftop water tanks. He noticed the top hatch to one tank was open. Lopez climbed a set of ladders and peered inside, he was horrified by what he saw. Floating face up in the water near the top of the tank was the body of a young woman. It was Elisa Lamb. Lopez told the police that no one could access the roof without tripping an alarm. In fact, he had to deactivate the alarm system before stepping out himself. Only hotel staff possessed the keys to the rooftop stairwell and door. According to the hotel's engineer, even if you did reach the roof without setting off an alarm, you'd have to climb onto the water tank platform, scale a second ladder to the top of the tanks, lift the heavy metal hatch, and jump inside. To this day, no one knows how Lamb reached the roof without setting off the alarm system, or how she gained entrance to the tank, and then, how or why she drowned. The autopsy revealed that Lamb's body was found naked in the water, with her clothing, 
the same clothes she had been wearing in the elevator video, strewn around her. Her body was moderately decomposed, as it had been approximately two weeks since she was last seen alive. There was no evidence of assault, sexual or otherwise. No drugs, besides ibuprofen, were found in her system. At the time of her death, the water tank was about half to three quarters full, leading some to question how an able-bodied woman could drown in a relatively small amount of standing water. In preparation for her ill-fated tour of the West Coast Lamb had started a Tumblr, Nouvelle, Nouveau, a landing place for quotations and fashion photography. There was nothing unusual about the site itself, though eerily it continued to update even after Lamb's death. While clearly Lamb had scheduled her Tumblr to post automatically, it left many to wonder if the dispatches might be messages from beyond the grave. The Lamb family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the Cecil Hotel, but their case was dismissed in late 2015. The judge said that there was nothing that the hotel did to allow Lamb to enter the roof, or to suggest that the roof or the water tanks were safe. Though the Cecil Hotel had seen its fair share of deaths, the notoriety of by Lamb case pushed its reputation over the edge, the hotel rebranded as the stay on Main. New name or old, the bizarre death of Elisa Lamb lingers on in the halls of this Los Angeles hotel. The chilling security footage lingers on as well, haunting you long after you've watched it.